Hey, so, at the risk of sounding incredibly pretentious, have you ever realized how valuable childhood is? It's a time in our lives we've all experienced, more or less, and it's not something that'll ever stop existing as long as we keep having children, but once it's over, you're never getting it back. You'll have nowhere to run when adulthood comes knocking, and eventually, it'll consume your entire being. Digesting your layers of innocence until you're stripped back to reveal the sad, sad person you truly are. So, to help that thirst in your heart that can never be quenched, people like looking back on their favorite moments from before they were cynical. And one near-universal experience we've all had in the past century or so has been reading or being read the lengthy novels of Theodore Geisel, aka Dr. Seuss. You might have heard of him. He made over 60 children's books, ranging from the subversively simple One Fish, Two Fish, Red Fish, Blue Fish, to the most unexpected comeback story of all time, the Cat in the Hat comes back. He sold around 600 million copies worldwide. He's got that one section at Universal Studios you never go to. He was born March 2nd, 1902 and died September 24th, 1991. I'm just reading his Wikipedia page at this point, but you know who I'm talking about. He's synonymous with early childhood literacy, and it's crazy to think about considering how timeless all of his books are, but their publishing dates go as far back as 1937. Unless you want to count the unfairly forgotten book of Pocket Boners from 1931. Real book he actually wrote, by the way, did not fake that, but seriously, the fact that they've been around for so long and are still so popular when YouTube kids videos exist now should be plenty enough to show how timelessly in fashion they really are. In a way, they're sort of an evolution of Aesop, who, in case you're in the dark as you didn't watch my last video, shameless plug, was a Greek philosopher that made these short fables using animals to teach lessons. And Seuss did the same kind of thing with fake creatures, whether they were Who's, Barbaloots, Sneetches, Cats, just anything creative he could come up with to tell stories. And while before I did kind of poke fun at his simpler books, they were always effective at what they set out to do. Before I go any further with that, though, I'd like to briefly mention today's sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends, and their new limited series, Call of the Arbiter, which you can watch for free in the game or on YouTube with new episodes every Thursday until July 20th. Now, I wasn't sure what to expect from a raid series focusing on lore, seeing as those kinds of things can often get too caught up in the world while forgetting everything else. But if the millions of accumulated views and positive comments weren't enough for you, I gotta say, they're pretty good. Each episode is a short, effective, character-focused story that understands how to integrate world-building into its plots without forgetting it's the cast that endears you to the experience. And if those characters end up speaking to you, I've got good news. You can find them in Raid along with some brand new lore, weekly challenges, and never-before-seen champions like Artok, who you can get if you sign in consistently for a week between now and July 24th. And if you've never played Raid before to begin with, you can use my link in the description or scan my QR code to get started with the epic champion Drake and a bunch of other bonuses. It's all live now, so this is your chance to get in on the new content Raid has to offer. Hope to see you guys in the game. Thanks to Raid for sponsoring, and back to the video. Sometimes they'd have lessons with meanings way deeper than you'd expect from a picture book. Like, no joke, while doing research, I found out he did a book about the Cold War and nuclear bombs, discrimination and prejudice, Hitler. No, I'm for real. Yertle the Turtle, as confirmed by Seuss, is a story about the rise of Hitler and authoritarianism. Then he's got the foot book. It's a book about feet. And that was the impressive thing about Seuss as an author. He can make a super powerful, easily understood allegory when the story demanded it, but he also never started writing anything with a moral in mind, since he considered forced lessons condescending to kids, who he believed could sniff him out a mile away. So a lot of his works were super substantive, but they didn't need to be, and Seuss having the skill to write both was part of what made him such a hit with parents and kids alike. He knew how to keep the mood light, silly, and whimsical when he wanted to, and during the times the story was grim, he'd have a thought-provoking ending to balance it out. The guy was a true entertainer, be it with picture books, novels, or political satire, and thanks to that accessibility, we've all had our own experiences reading his works for the first time. Er, that is, other than me. Seeing as personally speaking, I was a little too masculine to be reading, like some kind of gay, feminine, gay nerd baby. That's not true, I liked reading more than a lot of kids. But seriously, the first time I heard of the guy wasn't through one of his books at all. It was actually through this yearly tradition where, every time my family got a new Christmas tree, my dad would bring us together to watch a film with Seuss's name at the beginning, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. And we still do it every year to this day, whether we want to or not. But what is this animated version of Seuss's story? Where'd it come from? Well, releasing back in 1966, it was the first of multiple specials based on Seuss's works, including Horton Hears a Who, The Cat in the 
hats, the Lorax, and a couple others that no one cares about besides me. But as you might know, they aren't the only adaptations of his work, they're just the most recognizable since Seuss was pretty strict about how his works would be adapted during his lifetime, making rare exceptions for these specials, some shorts, and a line of toys not based on any pre-existing properties called Dr. Seuss's Zoo. The reason he didn't do much of anything else was to keep the focus on his books instead of commercializing them for profits, as Seuss was always an artist first, a businessman second, taking value in how kids perceived him and the works that he created. However, eventually, he did unfortunately die, and so the decision of who could play around with his works was left up to his widow Audrey, who allowed for the creation of musicals, TV shows, park rides, a bunch of other bullshit merchandise, and of course, films. Three animated, two live action, all so divisive that if you grew up with one and not the other, you'd probably have a totally different standard for what a Dr. Seuss adaptation is supposed to be. And with so much <clears throat> variety, <laughs> that does lead me to wonder, which are the closest to Seuss's original vision? They can't all be winners, that's just an inevitability. And they can't all be terrible, that's... Well, that's just me being hopeful, honestly, but hey, if we don't have hope in these trying times, then what do we have, huh? Nothing. Anyway, on with this video about Dr. Seuss adaptations. You're a mean one, Mr. Grinch. So, I've already mentioned what made Seuss popular in the first place, but to get more into specifics, what is it that defines something as unmistakably his? Obviously, there's his iconic art style, based in being charmingly simple and complex at the same time, using cross-hatching to shade curvy characters living in weird environments. His stories are conveyed in a direct, sincere manner to be understandable to kids, though Seuss made it a point that he wrote for people, not children, so the content could be enjoyed by anyone. Not to mention, he often chose to write them entirely in rhyme using anapestic tetrameter, or to translate it from snooty music reviewer talk, following every two weak syllables in a rhyme with one strong syllable for emphasis. But what may be the most important aspect of his books to note here is that they were short. Like, really, really short. On average, they're around 70 pages, a majority of which are filled with art, and while some are more thoroughly written than others, a lot of them aren't. I mean, Green Eggs and Ham was literally made on a dare by his publisher to create a story without using 50 unique words. They're intended to be to the point, and that's one of the reasons why, as a whole, the animated TV specials are the best at straight up adapting his work. The adapters didn't have to reach a feature length, so they didn't have to tape on a bunch of potentially stupid original content. They could stick to the original story and leave it at that without any filler. Or could they? You see, something funny about the TV specials is that even with their way shorter runtime compared to the films, they could still have trouble filling it, since a few of the stories they chose to adapt had almost no content to translate, meaning they very clearly had to add scenes that basically did nothing for the story to get it over the finish line, a tactic I'm sure the filmmakers took note of when adapting the exact same properties. However, on the positive side, unlike a majority of the films, they were able to keep in tune with Seuss's knack for entertainment, plot relevant or not, through a bunch of original songs that have become pretty recognizable in their own right. And what helped these songs be as memorable as they were wasn't just how they moved the plot forward, but what they did for the characters' personalities. Turning creatures like the Grinch from a typical isolated grump that hates Christmas into a lovably hateable asshole that's so petty he's willing to steal ice cubes. The Lorax adds songs featuring heavier dialogue between him and the Onceler as his business expands. Horton turns the Wickersham brothers from speechless henchmen into conspiracy nuts. And they worked in context because from conception to execution, they expanded on what Seuss had already written. Probably helped by the fact that Seuss himself was the one writing these specials. Yeah, when I said he was strict about anything outside of books, I meant that he wouldn't approve it unless he had full creative control over the project. But I don't want to make it sound like these were only any good because of him. Several popular artists contributed to the specials' various looks and feels over the years. Most notably, Looney Tunes animator Chuck Jones, Pink Panther co-creator Holly Pratt, and get this, Ralph Bakshi, the guy known for creating the first ever X-rated animated film, Fritz the Cat. And what I find astonishing about these varying directors is that they all had their own interpretations of Seuss's art, ranging widely in their approach, but none felt out of place or inappropriate in his style. Bakshi's special, The Butter Battle Book, was incredibly rough and recycled animation frequently to focus on making Seuss's fantastical creatures and gadgets move around and act as human as possible, befitting the down-to-earth theme of escalating warfare. Jones's shorts weren't quite as realistic, but were still limited in terms of animation, reusing shots to put more effort into certain 
certain higher quality ones, and otherwise relying on strong posing and body language to express the character's personalities. This is best demonstrated in their expressions, such as the infamous Grinch idea smile, an exaggeratedly devilish grin that was nowhere near as out there or hilarious in the book. As for Pratt, he was sort of the opposite in that he often created shorts with fluid, clean animation and more consistently on model characters that rarely recycled anything, making the trade-off of having less distinguished poses and expressions. Pratt's were also more so in line with Seuss's own art as opposed to Jones, who created a hybrid between Seuss and his own style. Whatever your preference in terms of directing though, they all contributed to making the special so iconic that, admittedly, the film adaptations took more inspiration from these than they did the original books, and to me, that makes sense. The specials might have a few minor flaws of their own, mainly in terms of pacing, but they added substance to what the books did. And with how little there is to work with for a film adaptation, almost like it's a bad idea, these modern writers are gonna need anything they can get. But like I said, I'm hopeful. I don't think it's impossible to make a decent Seuss film, even if I can't quite count it as a good adaptation for changing so much. What's truly important here is whether or not they, in having to do loose interpretations out of necessity, can stay true to what Seuss did in his books, or in short, not fuck it up. And I'm not gonna sugarcoat it, most of them do. So before that, let's go over the better ones. You really are a heel. Okay, so we've already established that the specials, at 25 minutes, had to pad for time anyway from having too much left over. So how the hell do they get around that same issue for three or more times as long? Well, when you come down to it, that's what distinguishes the decent from the dead to me, the gold stars from the detention slips, the you did a fine jobs from the you're adopted and I'm disowning yous. Really, the film's methods aren't too different from the specials. Aside from adapting the story as is, their main objective is taking what was done and adding a bit of depth. Or rather, that's the goal. If they succeed is a whole nother topic entirely, but the idea is to add context, characters, themes, scenes, what have you. Anything to get to that coveted feature runtime. And as you might assume, most of them barely make it past the threshold. Though, weirdly enough, of the two I chose to put in this section, the first was actually the longest by far at 97 minutes. So does that say more about what it does right or what the others did wrong? Guess you'll have to stick around to find out. I will hold your attention hostage if I need to. You're gonna fucking listen to my bit about Ron Howard's live-action Jim Carrey film from the year 2000. You're a mean one. Mr. Grinch. And look, I'm aware this film isn't the most beloved by everyone. It's definitely got its fans, but just as much it's got detractors that hate it for being more mean-spirited than the original. There are people who make fun of the makeup for looking weird. It's commonly criticized for adding a love triangle that somehow involves the Grinch. But as a viewer that's never seen the movie before deciding to do this video, I gotta be honest, I wasn't put off by any of it. For sure, I get the complaints. It's not gonna be a film that every fan of the animated version is gonna love, but I I see why these changes were made and think they do kind of have merits. Like, first of all, has there ever been a time when the Grinch wasn't a mean-spirited character? That was kind of his thing. Mistreating his dog for no reason, hating Christmas because he was too stubborn to try understanding it, generally causing mayhem. He was a mean-spirited guy. Jim Carrey just turns it up to 11, and he's often cited as the best part of the movie since the character's pretty much kept intact. All they change about him is his origin, and I don't have too big of a problem with that either. Under the wrong circumstances, <coughs> <clears throat> I would have disagreed with it, but Grinch 2000 does it about as tactfully as it could have been done. In case you're unaware of what the Grinch, as a character, is about, he's an old, isolated shithead that hates Christmas for its commercialism. Yeah, they technically say no one quite knows why he's got a hate boner for the holiday, but all the reasons he gives are based on the superficiality. The gluttony related to feasting, the noise made from playing with toys and singing. He doesn't recognize why they value the day beyond these things, so he eventually gets so fed up he steals it all, thinking it'll make the who's cry. But once he hears them singing and rejoicing in spite of everything, not a present or decoration in sight, he sees that he was wrong and perhaps Christmas is a little bit more. That's his character arc in the book and special, and it's all kept in the live action version. It's just more upfront about why he hates Christmas by giving him a backstory. As a kid, standing out from the other who's for his appearance and odd behavior, he was bullied and laughed at during the happiest time of the year. And in a moment he tried to be genuine with the girl he liked, everyone else was cruel. So he decided to go up into the 
the mountains, stewing in his hate for years to come. And maybe that's where the too mean-spirited claim comes from. After all, in the original, the Who's were all pure and happy and innocent to offset the cynical nature of the Grinch and prove that his assertions about the holiday are wrong. So making them just as cynical and rude kind of brings down the atmosphere, doesn't it? The way I see it, no. I don't think it does. I mean, is it reasonable to assume that a person could be as isolated and bitter as the Grinch without any outside influence? Of course. But is it also reasonable to assume that someone could end up the same way after feeling shunned and rejected, even if it wasn't true for everyone? I'd go as far as to say that's more likely. And if you met kids, they're horrible creatures. It's not exactly unrealistic. And them being flawed helps us to interpret where the Grinch's anger comes from. These Who's are materialistic. They do get caught up in the holiday. And in this version, Grinch lives at the dump, a place where people throw away their garbage and unwanted presents. After living in that type of environment for as long as he did, not knowing the true meaning of Christmas and watching all the rampant consumerism, it's no wonder he'd become such a Grinch. I dig that. How the Who's have lost the meaning of Christmas too. And it's not in spite of the Grinch stealing their presents that they sing, but because of it. In their current overly commercialized state, they couldn't see the true meaning. But with their presence gone, they had nothing left to appreciate but each other. It turns a one-sided lesson for the Grinch into a give-and-take scenario that keeps in spirit with the original and adds something of its own. And also, not all the Who's are negatively portrayed. The writers just condensed all their goodwill into Cindy Lou, who's been given a much bigger role than she once had. You see, the original Cindy Lou was less of a character, more so an idea. She's this tiny girl that asks the Grinch why he's stealing her tree, and he has to come up with a lie. She's supposed to be everything purely innocent about Christmas distilled into a kid, but she doesn't do much of anything in the story besides show off that the Grinch is devious, and we already got that before, so she could be seen as a little unnecessary in her original incarnation. Or at the least, she wasn't as integral when all the Who's were just as innocent and pure. But put that character in the live-action version's more cynically realistic setting among a crowd of Who's who've forgotten the meaning themselves? Her role gets accentuated she stands out. And like the Grinch, she's also been affected by the town, who've made her question her own optimism. That's what incites her to come to the Grinch wanting to brighten his Christmas, so she can prove to herself that there's more to the holiday than what the mayor and her parents are saying. And in a roundabout sort of way, that is what happens. If she had never come to the Grinch, he never would have come down to the town and been reminded of the traumatic events he'd been suppressing, leading to him seeking revenge through stealing their presents, leading to the happy ending where everyone understands the true meaning of Christmas and the Grinch gets laid. No no doubt it's complicated compared to the simplicity of the original, and it could be argued that it's less impactful than the Who's coming out and singing without even noticing that their material objects have been taken, but I find a certain sincerity and human quality in this version that stands out on its own without forsaking the message. Plus, it's one of only a few examples in these films that demonstrates adding a bunch of little details to a Sue's story doesn't inherently cause it to be worse off. A principle that could also be applied to the makeup and art direction. To be fair, not all of it is great. A couple of Who's look out of place or fall into the uncanny valley, and the colors overall can be less vibrant than the special, but I don't mind how a majority of the Who's look personally, as they do fit into Seuss's art style, but don't go too far, like some other films I know. And you gotta admit, it's impressive they were willing to get so many extras in such elaborate makeup for all the crowd shots. That's a level of care and effort you don't see too often, and it extends further than that. The Who's wardrobes, hairstyles, sizes, are all done in an effort to mimic Seuss's absurdity in real life, and it's visible in the scenery too. You look at the cars, appliances, houses, furniture, the Grinch's cave. It's not difficult seeing where all the budget went. They shot almost the entire film practically. There's not a single detail skimmed or cheaped out on. The production radiates appreciation for the source, and since it used almost no CGI for 95% of the movie, to this day, over 20 years later, it stays timelessly impressive. And you already know I couldn't go rambling about how the film looks without mentioning Carrie's Grinch makeup. That poor, poor man had to learn CGI CIA torture techniques to withstand how uncomfortable his costume and prosthetics were to work in every day. But it paid off spectacularly in the end. It's no wonder the film won an Oscar that year. It contributes so heavily to his performance, and I couldn't imagine the film without it or him. Much like the adaptation itself, he is into everyone's tastes, as he does go for an exaggerated take on the character, but neither him nor the plot loses sight of Seuss's ideas. They might be conveyed differently from the original, but in this case, that's not a bad thing. I'm getting closer than I ever thought. So, here's a movie you probably haven't thought about in a decade. I know I didn't before I decided to make this video. 
And isn't that kind of odd? Like, in contrast to every other film I'm gonna be talking about, this isn't really brought up all that often in conversation about adaptations, despite all the others often being hotly discussed. And as far as I can tell, that's most likely for one of several reasons. Firstly, it doesn't fit too neatly with any specific age of Seuss films the same way the others do. When you talk about Chuck Jones, Holly Pratt, Universal, Illumination, these are all eras of Seuss films. They've all got a certain vibe, look, and period of release that distinguishes them. But then there's Horton Hears a Who, this one-off film that came out at a time when rights for Seuss films were up in the air, and after it came out, nothing else Seuss-related came from the film's studio afterwards. It wasn't a spectacular failure or the biggest movie of the year. It did all right but not disastrous enough to be a cult classic or well enough to be a pop culture icon. It didn't have any major controversies, it was created by Blue Sky, who were sorta known for flying under the radar. And speaking on the film's content, I don't like using the word cringe, but... There are scenes in this movie that are... No, that's the end of the statement, they are. There's an anime parody... in 2008. Enough said. There's a Seth Rogen mouse that exists to be Seth Rogen. He does the customary Seth Rogen laugh. Jim Carrey does the voice of Horton, and about half his dialogue is badly timed references. Weirdly, it does one of those DreamWorks dance endings that comes right the hell out of nowhere. It's a bit much. However, when you get past those bits and look at the film as a whole on an adaptation level, I'd say otherwise, it does just about everything right. And in no short abundance, I think a big part of why it works is, strangely enough, its subject matter, which sounds like a a weird thing to call weird considering I'm discussing adaptations here, but let's face it, I'm talking about the most appealing Seuss-based film right now, and at best, it's a 7 out of 10 cause, spoiler alert for later, it's ungodly difficult to translate his work to 25 minutes, let alone an hour and a half. Not just from lack of pages and therefore lack of story, but also lack of content. Have you ever read a Dr. Seuss book? Half of them don't have a story at all. They've always got fantastical creatures, fun rhymes, possibly a lesson, but character-wise? On average, you're looking at maybe two named protagonists max. And antagonists are even rarer, at least in the classic protagonist Jones fights the evil Lord Darkness kind of way. His stories would occasionally have bad people like the Grinch or Yertle, but they were the main characters, not the ones being fought against by another lead. They'd be defeated or reformed by the end of the story, sure, but usually it was by their own hubris or change in heart, not a separate main character defeating them. Seuss's stories rarely had that kind of typical scenario. He was a freeform writer that preferred metaphorical victory over the straightforward kind. And that's not even taking into account settings. Most often, they were confined to the spaces the characters resided in with no room for expansion. Where are the Sneetches? I don't know, some beaches? Where did the Onceler discover truffula trees? A forest. What city do the kids from the Cat in the Hat live in? Who knows? For all we know, they could be living in a floating temporal void. We never see or hear for sure if there's anything outside of the space surrounding their house, so why bother? My point is, Seuss's books have almost nothing to expand on most of the time, they hardly follow the structure of a typical Hollywood film with a definitive beginning, middle, and end, and if they do, they're most frequently left intentionally vague to be less restrictive on what the story's lesson can apply to, or there's really nothing more that can be said. But, as you might have assumed, Horton has all all of these factors down packed. A full, defined cast of interpretable characters? Yep. Horton wants to protect a speck with tiny people on it, and Dr. Hoovy wants to prove to the other Who's that they are in fact living on a speck. Definitive traditional antagonists? Horton has three. The snooty kangaroo that berates him, saying he's causing problems, the Wickersham brothers, and Vlad Vladikov. Open setting with room for interpretation? Check. He lives in the jungle of Newell. Clear start, middle, and end? Yeah. He finds the clover, gets harassed for saying there are people on it, the Who's all band together to make noise and prove they're real, Kangaroo and the others admit they were wrong. Message about a general issue that could potentially be expanded and not lose its original meaning? Affirmative. The book's about caring for people, no matter how insignificant they might be perceived, how absurd it is to believe that them simply living their lives is a cause for concern, and that just because someone has a different set of beliefs from your own, it doesn't mean they've got a sinister plot in the works. Potential to expand on the story without being completely detached or otherwise fillery? I've run out of unique ways to say yes, but yeah, it's a story with plenty of open ends. Horton's the perfect contender on all fronts, and that means that, in turn, by far, it's the least detrimentally modified to fill out its runtime. In terms of wholly original characters, we get a good number of minor ones, including the Seth Rogen mouse, but none of them have all that major of an effect on the story, so it's not a big deal. As for the plot, on a basic level, it's exactly the same as the book. All of its most important plot beats are there in chronological order from the time it starts to the time 
diamond finishes. All this version does to enhance the plot for film scope is altering Horton's goal from protecting the flower to finding a place where it'll be safe as Kangaroo and the henchmen follow after. It's not too big a swerve in direction from the specials plot, but it helps structure the events cohesively while allowing time in between for comedy that most likely would have felt like filler if the plot were unchanged, but it's all in the context of Horton taking the flower from one spot to the next, so it doesn't come off that way. And moreover, those scenes, mostly of Horton getting in danger and the Who's world reacting, are fun and creative. If not a smidge inconsistent when you think about how them blowing in the wind didn't affect them, yet moving through the air when Vlad takes the clover does, but you know, that's accurate across every interpretation of the story, so I can't fault them too much for being faithful. Though on that note, there is one major element of the story that the film chooses to be a bit more current with, and I know what you're thinking, but don't worry, it's not like how most remakes choose to update classic stories and end up creating something exponentially worse, okay? This one is good and doesn't insult your intelligence. I know that sounds hard to believe coming from the Dr. Seuss movie with an anime parody, but I promise I'm not crazy. It's gotta do with the themes. Now, if you've been paying attention, I've already stated what the story's about, and for the most part, that doesn't change in the film. So what do they modernize? Characters and motivation. In the original, the animals calling Horton out were depicted as conspiratorial, hard-headed, and snooty. But that last adjective is a little outdated. You don't see too many people up turning their heads in a chauvinistic display of high society brown nosing. That's sort of an old concept. So to keep the antagonist acting more realistically to current times, or as realistically as you can for a talking animal, Kangaroo goes from a snob to an overly aggressive homeschool mom. This means that she makes the same kinds of arguments as her original version, but here she's got the added moralizing factor of think of the children, which is made relevant by turning Horton into a teacher. So after he finds the clover and says there are people on it, his students use it to be creative. I will say that Kangaroo's anger is a bit more comedic here, seeing as she straight up says, he's getting those kids to use their imaginations. It's sickening. But nonetheless, I enjoy how they updated her personality without removing the core of what she's about. They even use this new trait to give her kid an actual character, turning him from a mimic that repeated what she said into his own person with a mini arc of standing up to her. It's a clever integration that stays true to Seuss while doing its own thing. And speaking of bits that description applies to, the animation. A part of this movie that isn't talked about nearly as much as it should be. Like, it's always the Illumination movies that get all the credit for doing Seuss's style justice in 3D, but Horton nailed that look several years before them, and to me, it's way more consistently on point, this one character Jojo notwithstanding. He's basically the one instance in Horton of a greater problem I have with the Illumination adaptations, that being a misunderstanding of design philosophy. For example, you hear about that Clone Eye sequel season that came out? It's got that problem. The old characters from the 2000s season retain the look they had before, but the new ones have brighter neons and compose of a larger color range. They've got way more detail in their clothing. They just don't fit in the world. And that's the feeling I get looking at Illumination's Onceler or almost any of their human characters, who look straight out of Despicable Me in this distinctly Seuss world. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. What I'm saying is that Horton doesn't have that issue. All the characters, minus Jojo, match the world and get the Seuss vibe really well, whether they're new or old. It's got a succinct style that captures Seuss in its movements, models, textures, shot angles, composition, the colors. Oh boy, I love these naturally vibrant, varied, but not too oversaturated color schemes that come off so real yet so separate from our own world at the same time. It looks so uniquely Seussian, and that's the main reason I consider it superior to Grinch 2000. Since although live action can get close aesthetically, nothing tops what can be done with Seuss using animation. Regardless of which I think is better though, they both stand as worthwhile adaptations despite the odds, and it was all thanks to them, adding on to the themes of their previous incarnations while respecting what those incarnations wanted to say, on a basic level keeping their stories and structure very in line with the original, purely taking liberties for character interactions and developments, giving lesser characters personality beyond what they had, or otherwise keeping them in line with the source, and for the most part, staying true to the Seussian standard of being timeless, fun, and entertaining for people of all ages. The remaining films in this video are slowly going to disregard those principles one by one until they're all destroyed, creating products that would force Seuss to reanimate after 30 years of slumber specifically so he could roll over in his grave. It's not gonna be pretty, folks, so without further ado... Alright, I know for the past two films I've said they were contested critically, but now more than ever, I feel like this will be the one I received the most backlash for, so preemptively let me make it clear. I sorta understand why this film is defended. 
but it's a terrible adaptation and I'm not gonna bend myself over to say it's not. So let's start with the character design. I've already mentioned how it and Lorax's original characters look disjointed and weird in the Seuss world, but I'm not talking about them right now. I'm referring to one character design in particular. I'm sure you already know the one I'm talking about. This one. Look at how they've massacred my boy. I'm disappointed. Uh, no, that's not the right word. How about displeasing? I am displeased. Uh, d distressed? Distressed and grief-stricken. I, 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 I'm inconsolable. Probably consolable, but I do not particularly care for it, and I'm, I, frankly, I'm outraged. What do you want from me? It sucks. It goes against everything the Grinch is. Why? Well, as my first piece of evidence, have you ever heard his fucking theme song? Does this guy look as cuddly as a cactus? Granted, he's never not been furry, but there's a big difference between furry and cuddly. Baboons are furry, but you wouldn't want to go near one of them. And the Grinch should be the same. Less cuddly, more prickly. He needs sharp edges, pointed fingers, an ominous smile, wrinkles to show his age, and crooked posture. Where's all that gone? What did you do? And don't try to tell me they didn't know. Check out these early promotional images, they're so accurate! Then put this side by side with the actual poster, and do I even need to say anything? If you have these mystical little objects on your head called eyes, you should be able to get it. They trimmed his shoulders, sandpapered his face to remove imperfections, and his smile's been reduced so heavily they might as well have removed it. This isn't the face of the Grinch playing to steal Christmas, it's the sneer of a guy that asked you to Google something knowing he's right and wants to be a dick about it. I've seen a more sinister grin from Jim Carrey in the live-action film. And he was under pounds of makeup wearing painful colored contact lenses. What's this design's excuse? Do you feasibly believe that this guy's heart is an empty hole? That he has termites in his smile? His teeth are whiter than mine! Why would you keep an updated version of his theme and add lines like, teeth all yellow, when it doesn't match his appearance at all? And speaking of, what's with this new rendition of the theme song, man? It's terrible. It doesn't sound like the Grinch theme at all. It's pretty much the Despicable Me theme with a chorus of annoying children shouting, Ew. I'm having a bad, bad day. It's about time that I get my way. All them smiles, homie, I turn up to frown. All them decorations, I down, down. Steam rolling, whatever I see. Huh, oh, despicable me. So mad for Halloween, come around and we ain't knocking at your door, man. There's nothing mischievous about it in the slightest. It reminds me of a Pentatonix cover, and that's honestly insulting to the Pentatonix since they released their own version, and it's not as great as the original, but it's a million times better than this. I've heard one or two people get behind it, and I really wish I could. I'm a massive Tyler the Creator fan myself, but I can't. It's too overly processed and... Illumination-y, which is a word I just invented, but that's the best way to put it. I didn't even notice it was him at first, I thought it was Pharrell. It doesn't sound similar to anything Tyler's done past or present. In the credits, there's a new song he did that's way less generic, like he actually gave a shit. I'm the Grinch, send a new hoot, I live in hoot. But here, for the main theme of the movie, he sounds so bored. He was more enthusiastic on Jimmy Kimmel. How can you make up your mind what to get? But what if we took one of each kind of pet? And what's worse, beyond directly contradicting the Grinch's appearance, it doesn't match with his personality either. But what could I possibly mean when I say that? He's the Grinch, dubious trickster, malevolent grump, a personality so great at playing his role he became a noun. It's impossible to mischaracterize him. But if you stop to consider how a company would look if they put that sort of being at the center of a special IHOP Green Pancakes promotion, have you thought about that? Side note, I ate these when they were around out of curiosity, and it was the worst stack of pancakes I've ever eaten. Do not buy promotional food from IHOP. But seriously, it's a valid theory to assume he was altered as much as he was for the sake of being marketed as... I guess relatable instead of menacing? Like, ooh, good one, Grinch. You're a sassy girl making mildly rude statements, you go. Love the sarcasm in this pistachio ad. So relatable. Green and salty, just like his nut. Is the Grinch your long-lost sassy father? Find out with a 23andMe test today! What the fuck does this have to do with the Grinch? This movie's marketing budget was almost twice the production, by the way. But back on track, uh, what do you people think the Grinch is? He's an old curmudgeon that hates what he doesn't understand and chooses to take that frustration out on others for enjoying it when he doesn't. That's where his cruelty comes from. That's why he's described as having garlic in his soul, being as charming as an eel, having all the tender sweetness of a seasick crocodile. He's mean. He's inconsiderate. He hates 
next Christmas with a burning passion. Then over here, there's this guy. I don't know his name. It's certainly not the Grinch, so I'm gonna call him Kyle. Now, Kyle doesn't hate Christmas, not one bit. He wants Christmas. He desires it. But he never got to have it as a kid because he lived in an orphanage that apparently didn't celebrate Christmas for some reason and had literally no other children for him to form friendships with, since I suppose in Whoville, there are never unwanted children unless they're green. The racists. So for whatever unexplained reason, Kyle then went into the mountains and stayed there for 53 years. Not remaining isolated, mind you, but continually coming back into Whoville for food. And that kind of makes you wonder why he'd move so far away from them, simply to come back semi-frequently, causing minor mischief while pretending he's an evil mastermind, but... Dude, I don't have comedic answers for all of this, it's just stupid as hell. So let me get this straight, they took the Grinch, an isolated, angry loner, and they turned him into a sad boy douche that won't admit he loves Christmas, yet they also employ the language of the original and end up oxymoronic by doing so. Oh, you say Roast Beast is a feast the Grinch can't stand in the least? I don't know, doesn't look that way. Correct me if I'm wrong, but he seems a bit less grouchy and wrathful, more longing? Envious? Hell, even during the moments he's coming up with a scheme for stealing Christmas, he clearly wants not only a family, but the presents and food too. You know, the shit he's supposed to be stealing, thinking that's all the Who's care about, which he hates. And actually, while we're on the topic, this dramatic shift in attitude makes his whole stealing Christmas thing way less clearly motivated. Like the OG, original Grinch, wanted to actively ruin the enjoyment of others for his own satisfaction, taking pleasure in disrupting the festivities he hated so much. And this version does too, I guess, but um, I don't believe it at all. I get that they're going for this kind of doesn't want to interact with Christmas because bad memories and trauma and blah blah blah. That gives him Puss in Boots 2 style panic attacks as if he was scarred, though it's super inconsistent when we see him fine around Christmas stuff so often and visibly showing interest. But nevertheless, I don't understand why he'd want to extend that pain to others. He's not the dog abusing, stealing from babies, gnarly son of a bitch we know. He's... A mildly grumpy hipster with parental issues. And following that line of thought, what exactly does he plan to accomplish by stealing Christmas? Does he assume that after one bad year, the Who's are all gonna collectively agree? Well, shit. No Christmas this year. Man, looks like we're gonna have to cancel every other year from here on. That's how it works, after all. The OG had a point. He wanted to prove that Christmas is this superficial holiday and force the Who's to break down, simultaneously getting the peace he'd wanted for so long. That was his catalyst. New Grinch starts getting annoyed after they put up a tree that he'll see from his cave, bringing back all the bad memories. Uh, so, let me ask you this. Why doesn't he steal the tree and leave it at that? then he can do what he does every year and not have to acknowledge them. Taking all their presents and decorations is sorta extra when it's the tree in his peripheral vision. Though funnily enough, despite how much emphasis it's given as one of the determining factors behind him stealing Christmas in the first place, you wanna guess the one thing he didn't take? But what's more confusing to me than that is his revelation. What's he revelationing about? The OG had no idea what Christmas was for, so he assumed it was the commercial stuff. Then after being proven wrong, his heart grew and he changed his ways, seeing its true value. But this film does not have that. It makes itself very clear on the idea that this Grinch never had a family to share Christmas with. And that's why he doesn't want to acknowledge it. So what new lesson does he learn from watching the Who's gather and sing? They were already celebrating as a city before, so what makes this different to him? What does it say? That he should stop isolating himself and join in? Okay. What's that got to do with him stealing their presents? It's been made a total non sequitur to what's going on. Did they just keep it for the sake of giving the Grinch a redemptive moment? But wait, he doesn't need a redemptive moment, cause here, he isn't a bad guy. I think the biggest conflict of interest with Illumination's take on this property is that they've made all these sweeping changes to his personality, motives, etc. But they want to use the legacy material to cash in, and they can't change the stuff too drastically or be in danger of- <gasps> taking a risk, so that means keeping the same general phrases and lyrics. But it does such a bad job at describing the new Grinch and his character, it's as if the film is having an identity crisis. I mean, fuck me. As the song explicitly says, friends you don't have none, Max is bringing him coffee in bed. Not out of fear, mind you, but out of generosity, since he and the Grinch have a good relationship across the entire film. 
There's not so much as a hint of abuse. I realized how that made me sound as I said it, but it's true. New Grinch never does a single bad thing to Max. In fact, he apologizes for getting mad at him. They're unironically best friends. And Max isn't the only one he's nice to either. About halfway through the movie, New Grinch gets this fat reindeer, how original, and as you'd expect, he's used for some added comic relief until his family shows up and New Grinch lets him go almost immediately, recognizing how important family is. Wow! It's almost as if he learned his lesson and did his kind deed before he was supposed to in the story, thereby completely devaluing his monumental moment of selflessness at the climax. You goddamn imbeciles. What's the point in saying his heart is two sizes too small if he doesn't act like it? Was Illumination so scared to pull the trigger and create a dastardly, intentionally unlikable main character? He's the Grinch! That's his whole deal! It doesn't even work by the standards they set. We're meant to believe he's an unlikable loved hermit that shuts others out, but he does all of his sulking with Max. They hang out together. They cuddle in bed. He gives New Grinch the exact kind of affection he longed for as a kid during Christmas time, so I gotta ask, why doesn't he just go ahead and celebrate with Max instead of pretending he doesn't want it? If he were crueler to Max, it actually would have made more sense. It could have been worked into its own message about Grinch being so caught up in his hate, he couldn't see the thing he wanted was there all along. But no, you couldn't market an animal abuser for pistachio ads. That's why The Grinch is a fondly remembered classic that's consistently remained in the public conscious for the past 60 years. But don't worry, to compensate for The Grinch himself lacking any real screen presence, we thankfully get a subplot with Cindy Lou about capturing Santa with her new brigade of one-note disposable friends. It's a story that goes nowhere, lasts for way longer than it should, and by the end, all she provides the movie with is a statement that family is good, and people, get this, should be happy. So, why do I consider this the least terrible of the Bad Seuss adaptations? Well, on the positive side, the animation is nice. The ending with New Grinch awkwardly making small talk at a Christmas party, but being welcomed anyway, was sort of charming in its own way. And as a film detached from its source material, it's... Well, it's still incredibly confused, but you could enjoy it as a standalone product. Personally, I don't, but at the least, I understand liking it better than Fun, fun, fun! No more rain, look, it's the sun, sun, sun! Ah, uh, yes, the lesser of the two live-action Seuss films. The one that for sure wouldn't have existed had it not been for the success of the other. See, whether you were a big fan of the Jim Carrey Grinch or not, one thing that couldn't be denied was its success. Everyone went and got a ticket. Domestically, it was the biggest film of of the year, and after the fact it stayed relevant through TV reruns. People enjoyed it for providing a new, zanier, but still familiar take on a classic property. And you know how the entertainment industry is. The moment they smell the scent of a franchise, they keep churning that puppy out for all it's worth, and then after it loses steam, they dispose of it like a used condom. It just so happens that in this case, the condom broke on its own. <laughs> but why did Cat fail while Grinch succeeded? Well, for one thing, Grinch didn't suck. Grinch wasn't created with any particular expectations in mind. There had never been a feature-length film based on a Dr. Seuss book at the time, so the cast and crew were able to do with it what they wanted within a PG rating, and in my opinion, it turned out better than expected. But Cat in the Hat didn't have those same liberties. It was created in the shadow of an incredibly popular adaptation, meaning people wanted it to be just as good, and and Universal wanted it to be just as profitable, so it fell into the pit trap that a hundred sequels and spiritual successors have fallen into. They tried to copy what they thought made the original work, and in this case, the cat team assumed it was having raunchier humor, getting more mean-spirited, adding a bunch of characters that weren't there before, focusing heavily on the production design, and casting a currently in celebrity character actor to play the titular role. However, it doesn't work in this case due to, besides the Grinch as a film having way more to it than that, the property in question not meshing with these concepts, since the cat and his stories have almost nothing in common with the Grinch to begin with. Really, they're opposites by design. Seuss himself has gone on record mentioning that the two characters, whose books were released in the same year, each represented the two sides of his own personality. One, a grumpy, stubborn old man, frustrated at the world around him, the other, an innocent trickster and kid at heart that wants to have fun. They're so diametrically opposed, there was an original special in the 80s about them going up against each other, the Grinch Grinch 
which is the cat in the hat, and it perfectly highlights what made them so different. The cat is smart, peaceful, and positive. The Grinch is crotchety, malicious, and surly. It's weird for one to act like the other except under hyper-specific circumstances, so giving Cat any of Grinch's character traits like intentional sarcasm, rudeness, that sort of thing, it feels off. Like, if you're familiar with any other version of the cat, you can tell there's something not right about the way he's acting. The cat wouldn't make erection and castration jokes or attempt to beat a kid over the head with a bat. He wouldn't make sarcastic jabs berating the brother and sister. Part of his charm came from pretending to be ignorant so he could teach whoever he was messing with a lesson. And that twist is still here in the film, but I never got the idea that this cat wasn't in control. He's too self-aware. A quality that works on the Grinch as an angry cynic, but not so much on a whimsical jokester like the cat. Also, I'm gonna go ahead and state the obvious, Mike Myers is horribly miscast in this film. I understand why he's here, he was the biggest thing ever between the late 90s and early aughts, but he and Jim Carrey are nothing alike as comedians. The cat is hyperactive. In the books and special, there's almost never a moment he isn't moving. It's a trait you can see in Seuss's own list of actors he'd have had to play the cat if a movie were ever created back in the 80s. Robin Williams, Steve Martin, Eddie Murphy, John Candy, Jack Nicholson, these guys all have the same energy as Carrie. But then again, he probably thought of this list with an animated feature in mind, not... That. But my point stands. Carrie had the right stuff and forced himself to work in the suit for the sake of a killer performance, but Myers is visibly restrained. He is fighting with this costume to get any kind of motion. And I can only imagine how difficult it was to wear with three hours of makeup caked on during the summer in Pomona, California. Not to mention the only reason he was there was out of a contractual obligation to Universal, so he was always grumpy on set, never talked to anyone off take, and generally hated being there. Sounds like a torturous experience for both the crew and Myers all around, especially considering he basically had to carry this film on his back since he has so little to work with. And that's the real crux of turning Cat in the Hat into a film. There's almost nothing to adapt. It's Seuss's most recognizable character by far, but in terms of actual material, his stories are about as bare bones basic as you can get. In his main book, the cat comes to visit a brother and sister when it starts raining, he balances stuff, he brings out thing one and thing two to have extra fun, but they mess up the house so the kids kick him out, and the cat cleans up. It's a simple story about how it's okay to break the rules, as long as you know when to draw the line. And the way I see it, that makes it terrible for adaptation, including in the special, which had a five minute song about him singing about what his name means in various languages, and the special was 25 minutes. I said it once and I'll say it again, how in the hell could you stretch that to three times as long? Cause yeah, not counting credits, The Cat in the Hat is 74 minutes long, it's the shortest of any Seuss film. But then again, that's probably for the best, seeing as they effectively had to overhaul the plot to wring any substance out of it, and what they came up with is about as generically 2000s as you can imagine. Tell me if you've heard this one before. An overworked one-parent mother is stressed about two things, her demanding job that's having her throw an office party at home, and her two children, a troublemaking son who's always breaking the rules, and a control freak daughter who's losing friends. But she can't take care of them as she gets everything ready, so she sends a mildly offensive stereotype over to babysit. And that's when the cat appears to help the siblings by giving them a day of fun to reach a balance. Oh, and the mom's got a deadbeat boyfriend who pretends to be successful, but in reality he's a slob that wants to marry the mom for money and send the son off to military school, and she doesn't believe the kids because of course she doesn't. He's not important though, so you can disregard him. Back to the idea though, it does sound like an alright expansion of the book on a conceptual level. Take the mild, unassuming kids from the story and turn them into the worst versions of either extreme so they can slow through experiences, reach a healthy medium at the end. In practice though, it doesn't make sense, considering the whole two extremes bit was already covered by other characters in the book who are here too. I haven't mentioned him up to this point, but in every version of The Cat in the Hat, including this one, the children have a talking fish that tells them they shouldn't do any of what the cat does. He's the control freak that follows all the rules. Then you've got the cat himself and the things, who seemingly have no self-control at all and do whatever they want. They're supposed to be the two sides kids shouldn't want to imitate, coming to that realization on their own after reading how boring following every rule or how crazy following none of them can be. But I suppose a book accessible to four-year-olds wasn't clear enough for the general public, so they had to spell it out for them as blatantly as possible.
Actually, that sounds about right, but still, the characters to tell these ideas already existed and they still do in the film. So if the base is already covered using the kids, the fish has nothing to do, just repeating what the daughter says, and Cat doubles for the son. They're totally redundant, and the kids aren't good replacements either. Their actors are bad, especially the kid playing the son. And outside of the opening, there's nothing done to characterize the two as individuals beyond their archetypes, which... Why would you give them new personalities if you weren't going to expand on them? I don't know, man. I guess they had to put more time into showing off all these sets to get their money for them. And I'm sorry, but they're a massive downgrade from Grinch, and I cannot stop thinking about how much they missed the mark. It's nice that they're practically built, I respect the effort that was put in, and the log flume scene looks pretty impressive overall, but most of the movie is set in this bleached, monotone suburbia that I've heard defenders of the film call right out of a Seuss book, and it makes me want to ask, what are you people smoking? How in any way does this resemble a Seuss book? Have you ever read one? Yes, they usually came in a couple colors, but Seuss always found a way to make them look as varied as he could in spite of those limitations. And in the cases they did get to be in full color, he never held back. He was all about wacky color schemes, bendy shapes, buildings and structures that boggle the mind. The guy was a fanatic about fantastical imagery. That's why I appreciated the set design in Grinch so much. All the props, vehicles, houses, and whatever else were created to replicate the Seuss art style as faithfully as possible in live action. Plus, it had the most extensive makeup, hairstyling, and costuming of any cast, including extras, since The Wizard of Oz. And I'm not saying they need to be new records here, but this set was built from the ground up and you've got a blueprint ready for how a Seuss city should look. Is it too much to ask that you get a little creative? Oh, uh, but I forgot. The director worked on one too many Tim Burton films, so instead of a fun setting, we have to deal with this wannabe Edward Scissorhand shit meant to display the forced artificial conformity of suburban neighborhoods, removing any personality for the sake of symmetry. And that's okay on its own, I guess, but you could still do that concept and remain Seussian. Just take a little... Just take a... Just take... Illumination's Lorax, for example. As much as I... Nope. I'll save it for later, given a compliment. Fneedville, an artificial city in that film, on a visual level, pulls this exact concept off a million times better. Like in Cat, all the homes are close in appearance, capturing the feeling of conformist suburbia, but structurally, the homes in Lorax have curves and other extra details that help accentuate the Seussian style, making it stand out way more compared to this bland, angular monstrosity. From what I've read, it's done this way so the cat and his inventions pop out more as otherworldly, but this is a Dr. Seuss film, so I'd expect it to look like a Dr. Seuss book. And that extends to the prop design too, which I am fully convinced no one gave a singular shit about. All they did was color regular objects to be green or purple and called it a day. That's not a Dr. Seuss car, that's a fucking Ford Focus. Did all the prop budget go into these trees? If so, I hope the guy who made that decision was fired, because these do not look Seussian either. It's a mismatch disaster. A perfect way to describe this entire film, really. But, in the grand scheme of things, it's still not the worst adaptation. Because it's not- How bad can, can, can I be? <laughs> wow, Braxton, wow. For a guy that likes to mention the word original so much, you sure have an opinion that is one. Yeah, yeah, shove it up, your ugly ass. The truth is, popular takes exist for a reason. As I highlighted in my boys' comics video, it's not always a good reason, but let's just say this isn't a hidden gem scorned by a public that didn't want to give it a chance or understand what it was trying to say. Quite the opposite, really. People knew very well what this wanted to say, and that's part of why they hate it. For the deeper implications. If if you looked at Lorax 2012 through surface level observations, you could come to the conclusion it was just another Save the Trees film with an emphasis on how businesses exploit nature for profit. And generally speaking, a lot of people assume that's all the story always was. However, anyone who actually has a good grasp of the full message Seuss was going for could see this was a fucking mockery of his work. Like, if you're out of the know, believe it or not, the original Lorax story is one of, if not the most complex, melancholic, bleak story in Seuss's entire bibliography. Not just for being about corporate exploitation and pollution, a million preachy bargain bin VHS has told you that, but for how it chose to portray the companies that do this environmental harm. Not as evil or openly hostile, 
but apathetic. They don't care what they're doing and don't have an opinion about their actions since they aren't really a singular person. They're a conglomerate, an amalgam of people looking to make the group succeed through the least costly methods possible. That's why they cut down the trees, pollute the air, reap the earth. It's the best way for them to make money. They don't have any deeper ulterior motive, there's just no cheaper way to run their operations. Of course, they know what they're doing, it's not like they're ignorant to the harm they're causing, but they wouldn't get anything out of changing aside from peace of mind. And that's something that an individual would feel, not a corporation. All a company cares for is itself. It doesn't compromise. It can't be reasoned with. It doesn't have a face. And that's why the main character of the book, The Onceler, is never seen. He's just a pair of hands representing any company, executive, or business. He chops down truffula trees to create useless inventions that equally faceless consumers buy en masse. He brings in other identical Oncelers to help grow as fast as possible, illustrating how common he is. And no matter what the Lorax, the voice of the forest, tells him is happening to the world as he keeps biggering for the sake of his own greed, Onceler always meets his concerns with empty promises, platitudes, and excuses for why he can't stop or compromise. If not him, someone else would do it. He can't fire his workers, they have families. Progress is progress. It's one of the additions that, I think, makes the TV special superior to the book, as it gives the Lorax and Wensler these great interactions that further characterize the moral grayness of what he's doing. But in the end, no matter the excuse, no matter the justification for why, the fact is it all leads to the same conclusion. The truffula trees eventually die off, as do the animals that needed them to survive. So with no more to exploit, the Onceler is left alone to sit on a throne overlooking his kingdom of dirt, only having one word left by the Lorax to ponder on, unless. But apparently, Illumination Entertainment wasn't confident that the Onceler story, on its own, would be enough to fill out a feature runtime. So before, during, and after his retelling of events, we get a whole nother story added on top, and you guessed it, it sucks ass balls. I don't think they could have filled it out worse if they tried. Oh, oh, and you want to know where they draw the inspiration for this extra material from? Well, in the original story and special, there's an unnamed boy that the Onceler tells his story to. And after delivering his message about the importance of care a whole awful lot, he gives the boy a final truffula seed, telling him to give it the love he never did so that perhaps the Lorax and his friends can finally come back to a world that isn't destroyed. The boy then walks off into the distance, and the story concludes before we know what he does with the seed, delivering a powerful ending for the children watching that just like the nameless boy, it's up to them, as the next generation, to choose whether or not they'll be the change, since no one else can do it for them. Or at least that was the ending, till Illumination saw this highly intentional ambiguity using a personality-less character and thought, But why didn't he go to the Onceler? Why didn't he ask about the trees? Did he plant the seed? And I know it sounds like I'm joking, but no, I'm being dead serious. They saw this nameless character, who was created to be as basic as possible so children could self-insert themselves into his role, and they decided he had so much potential, it was worth dedicating around half of the film to his adventures. Do I need to tell you what's wrong with this picture? There's a massive cock drawn right in the middle of it, so it shouldn't be too difficult to figure out. And I swear, the subplot they came up with for this kid is the most deviant art level fan fiction inclusion ever. Get this. The unnamed kid, now called Ted, doesn't want to learn about what happened to the trees out of innocent curiosity, but instead so he can get one to impress an older girl who's obsessed with trees, Audrey. But there aren't any real trees in his artificial city where people buy canned air to keep it clean, and no Nobody seems to know a thing about him, so on the advice of his grandmother, he goes to the Onceler, hoping he'll know where to get one. And disregarding all the logical gaps that would come from this premise, such as these. Let it die, let it die. Let it shrivel up and come on, who's with me, huh? The question I want to focus on here is, why the fuck does Ted need a love interest when it would be far simpler to make it so he wants a tree? Like, it wouldn't fix the issues associated with his character, he's unrelentingly boring as a protag, and the fact he's been given a character in the first place contradicts his role in the original story. But if they were gonna do it anyway, they could have at least given him a less generic motivation than, I'm a dorky guy, and I like a girl, and she likes 
likes three, so I'm gonna get a three. That's so endlessly shallow and boring as far as characterization goes. And the funny thing is, at first, being shallow was the whole point of his character. And I'm not talking about the original, I mean the earlier draft version of Ted for this film, who, according to a demo track of the opening theme, was gonna be a kid that constantly swooned after whatever it is he didn't have, implying that he would have gone to the one slur out of a materialistic desire, which, if true, still would have missed the kid's original point, but it would have expanded on an element that wasn't highlighted too much before in the Lorax, that being the consumer side. See, from the beginning, we understand that consumers are the ones that fuel the one slur's business, allowing him to grow, and they don't have faces, same as him, so they could represent any one customer, but unlike the one slur, we never get a deeper exploration of their excuses for buying needs, what drives them to feel like they need it. So, creating a character whose whole point is representing ignorant consumers that slowly become self-aware would make for an interesting addition that doesn't forsake the book. But we didn't get that reality, did we? And even if that were how it ended up, there'd still be another glaring oversight in Ted's story that contradicts everything the book stands for. Aloysius O'Hare, the evil businessman that Ted needs to take down. Yeah, remember back when I said that there aren't that many true classic cut and dry bad guys in Sue's stories? That was for a reason. One that's no better highlighted than in The Lorax, a story about the inherent moral grayness of corporate apathy. And I suppose I suppose, in a way, they try to go for that same kind of approach with O'Hare, and that he only dislikes trees for interfering with his business, but let's be real here, if you put the two into full context, it's abundantly clear that he and the one slur are worlds apart. I mean, O'Hare isn't down to earth in the slightest, he's a comically over-the-top bad guy that literally sells the air that people breathe. He's nowhere near the realistic portrayal of a growing business that the one slur presents. And speaking of, another aspect that separates the two is, while the one slur caused pollution as a result of his growth, he didn't directly profit off of causing pollution. You get what I'm saying? It was just a byproduct of his progress that he saw as necessary to keep expanding. And the tragedy of his character is that, in continuing to expand, he inadvertently depleted the natural resources he needed until they were gone, demonstrating the two-sided nature of greed. But then you look at O'Hare, and he's the exact opposite. He doesn't merely cause harm by progressing, he progresses by causing harm. He intentionally, maliciously pollutes the air so he can sell it back to people with a price tag. Ergo, it's not a matter of O'Hare turning a blind eye when it suits him, unwilling to compromise and find a healthy medium between his pursuits and what's good for the earth, like the Onceler. It is a situation where he needs to destroy the air and keep the masses ignorant of trees for his business to succeed. It is founded on bad intentions. This is a straight-up supervillain organization he's running. No ambiguity about it. O'Hare is an evil being that chooses to do evil for evil reasons. And so, again, in contrast to the Onceler, the film treats it so after he is defeated, everything can finally be as it should. The citizens of Thneedville accept trees, we see the Truffulas start to grow back, the Onceler leaves his perch, and the Lorax, who in the original story left after all his pleas were denied, comes the fuck back, baby, he's, he's back. All the substance and thought-provoking bleakness mixed with hope has been thrown out the door now that all the big bad people causing all the big bad issues are gone. And that's what I hate more than anything about O'Hare. He's seen as the singular root cause of all that's holding people back from fixing the planet, and in this film he is. But the real world doesn't work that way. We are not gonna fix all of the Earth's pollution by punching Jeff Bezos in the face Captain Planet style. It ain't that easy. A company won't fall to the ground in pieces and reform its polluting ways if its CEO resigns. You know what will happen? they'll get another CEO. Because decisions made by the company are the collective choices of the company, not an individual. That's why the one slur is faceless. He's more than a person. He's an idea. But Illumination couldn't get that, or rather, they did get it, and they didn't want to push that kind of narrative, as in, the correct one. So instead, they reinforce the idea that our world being so heavily polluted is all the fault of bad-acting individuals by committing the ultimate sin and giving the Onceler a face. But if you want to hear Illumination CEO Chris Melodondri's explanation, he's been quoted as saying, The minute you make the Onceler a monster, you allow the audience to interpret that the problem is caused by someone who is different from me, and it ceases to be a story that is about all of us. Then it's a story about, oh, I see, the person who led us into this predicament is not a person, it's somebody very, very different, and so it takes you off the hook. Or to put it more honestly,
Uh, Mr. Gazel, we have sort of a problem here. Yeah, your book's main antagonist kind of puts companies in a bad light, so if you could let us deliberately misinterpret your characters to suit our own interests, that'd be great. But, 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 but I don't want you to do that. This is, uh, this is my story. This is Well, my... uh, <laughs> unfortunately, you're no longer employed at the company we call Living, so we're just gonna take that story there. If you couldn't tell, I'm a little peeved by this decision, seeing as it kinda, sorta contradicts everything the Onceler is. And now, I'm not saying there isn't a message about personal responsibility in the Lorax. The moral of the story is that when people, no matter their motivation, don't care about the world around them and allow it to become worse, nothing will ever get better. On an emotional level, we can relate to the Onceler in that anyone could become him with the right amount of greed-induced indifference. And basic consumers are portrayed in the story as feeding into the Onceler's business, establishing that we all have a part to play. However, there's also a disconnect between the Onceler and your typical viewer when you consider that the average Joe Schmo doesn't have the authority to pave roads, create factories, or cause pollution on a mass scale. That's a kind of authority reserved for the most powerful corporations. And that's also the second reason why Onceler is faceless. The first being so anyone could see themselves in his shoes, since he isn't and never was a monster. He could be anything behind those hands, including you. But the second reason is that, beyond a critique of individuals and human nature, the Onceler is a stand-in for faceless corporations. Ones that will always do far more harm to the environment than any singular person can. And you shouldn't present it as though they're equal. For sure, it's important that everyone contributes whenever they can. You shouldn't be a nihilist about doing your part to help the planet just because you're so insignificant. But at the same time, we also shouldn't put the blame solely on the individual. That's a narrative that companies push so they can pass the buck, when in reality, it's a two-way street and the Onceler, as he was, found a remarkable balance between the two. He had relatable elements, you could understand why he made the decisions he did, but at the same time, he wasn't someone you felt sorry for. He dug his own grave. All the negative that came his way was a direct result of his actions and corporate uncaring attitude. You empathize, not sympathize. We need that disconnect of not knowing what he looks like, since giving a company a face would humanize it to us. And the only times a company can humanize itself is through a mask. These squeaky clean, lovably marketable creatures that personify what the corporations are doing in as cute and non-threateningly a way as possible. That's what the modern Onceler is. He is the antithesis to the original, a character with a face and personal motivations that take away the imprintable nature he once had as a faceless, nondescript entity for the sake of giving a representation of companies that you'll look at and say, huh. Maybe we should sympathize with companies that pollute the environment, when you absolutely should not. They know exactly what they're doing, and when I say that, I mean both corporations and their destructive practices, and illumination in making it so the Onceler doesn't do what he does for his own ambitions, but for the love of his evil, manipulative family. Another expansion of a concept from the books that goes against their original purpose. They were never supposed to be the real masterminds behind the Onceler's descent, they were around to comment on how unspecial the Onceler is that he's one of many opportunistic people or organizations which, after the wells dried up, will move on and leave their glorious leader behind the same way the Onceler himself left behind devastation. So call it a hunch, but I don't think the modern Onceler is a mother manipulating her son into chopping down trees for her approval. And hey, wait a second! Melodondry said the decision to give the Onceler a face and all this other stupid shit was so we'd relate to him and see that these problems are caused by people like us. But I don't know too many people with evil fairy tales relatives, and doesn't his greed being the result of his family remove the idea that it was his decision? You want to talk about making people feel like the issue isn't their problem, this setup removes so much responsibility on the Onceler's part, it turns him into less of a Onceler, more a... Goro Akechi. This kid manipulated by his estranged family to do terrible things until he gets used to it, before that same family abandons him after they've ruined his life and destroyed everything around them for personal gain. It turns him into a victim. A guy that, rather than making conscious decisions that harm the environment, claiming it was for the greater good, chose to remain ignorant of what was happening until it was too late. And once he sees what he's done, he looks so devastated. Like he didn't realize all the harm he was doing. Bull. 
Shit. This is exactly what companies want you to think of them when it's revealed they've done something horrible. Even in his I'm a villain now song, How Bad Can I Be, he's passively unaware of what he's doing besides chopping down some trees, matching the innocent poppy vibe. Almost makes you forget the infamously better cut version of this same number, Biggering. A song that demonstrates his knowing apathy with the reverence of a biblical chorus behind him. Though, in a way, I could see the songs working in tandem as a slow burn focusing on the one descent, going from innocently unaware to knowingly indifferent, helping us understand that anyone, no matter how noble the intentions, could fall to greed. But then again, that wouldn't work unless the family was removed. And they can't have that. Who would the film blame for all the Onesler did? It couldn't be himself. That wouldn't make sense. He didn't know, I tell you, he didn't know. Oh, and the Lorax is, uh, he's there too. I kind of forgot. He's been made so inconsequential to the overall film, he's not really worth discussing. I mean, he's a far cry from the book's interpretation, but that's par for the course at this point, so... What more do you want me to say? It's another tick on the rap sheet of a film that's proven it doesn't care about Seuss's message or the audience, instead choosing to play it safe to avoid any backlash from the corporate machine, leading to one of the safest, most boring, unoriginal pieces of media in the past decade. And I really want to accentuate that it doesn't have a single creative bone in its body. If Cat in the Hat was a pile of overused 2000s kids media cliches, then this is the 2010s equivalent, no question. What have we got here? A dorky tween that wants to impress an older girl with no personality who's out of his league, an embarrassing Jewish mom and cool extreme grandma, a grumpy, sarcastic, mysterious old man, an over-the-top, short, comical, evil businessman that hates nature, cute mascots with funny innocent and fat versions, plus a scene of those mascots acting cute in a dream sequence. We need to face the facts, people. Everything Illumination added is unoriginal garbage, and everything they brought over from the original story they turned to garbage. The message was flipped on its head to mean the exact opposite. Not a single character from the book is in character. Any level of relatability or hard-hitting social commentary has been removed out of cowardice. Other than the animation, I can't come up with a single bit of praise for this as a movie or as an adaptation. But... Saying that does bring me to an interesting thought. Across this video, I've brought up a couple times how divided people can be on Seuss adaptations, preparing myself for backlash in one way or another from different sectors of fans. But if I'm being completely honest, I'm not 100% if there's a single one the fans aren't divided about. Like, yeah, according to critics, people are more into Horton and less into Cat, but as a general consensus, I've heard people that call Cat underrated and Horton boring. I've talked to people in regular conversation in real life who argue dollars to doorknobs that the Lorax is a hood classic. And I didn't quite understand where this divide came from before, but having analyzed all of the films in this video, I think I get it now. Each of these movies, depending on your perception, can mean something totally different based on your expectations of what a Seuss movie should be. If you were a stone-cold traditionalist for the Chuck Jones Grinch, I could understand hating the Jim Carrey film. If you didn't come in with any expectations for the Cat in the Hat, you could find a strange charm in its weird design and lack of shape. If you like the Lorax, you're stupid, but regardless of individual preference for how each of these stand on their own, I hope I've made my case for why I feel the way I do about them as adaptations. And weirdly, I'm not only terrified, but also morbidly curious to see what else the rights holders might want to do with Seuss's work, considering they keep trying to adapt something that's seemingly so unadaptable for film. And with that said, all I have left for you is this. There is fun to be had, there is hate to be yelled. But the worst was so bad, and the best was just... well. We've seen good Seuss, seen bad Seuss, seen true Seuss, seen loose Seuss, but now I think... Whew. That might be enough, Seuss. I've been just, uh... You've been Seussy Bacas. That one physically hurt to say. Thanks for watching. Another thanks to Raid for sponsoring. Don't forget to check out my link in the description or scan my QR code to get some extra bonuses in the game. And peace out.